room, what do you think they would say about this category of nature or the natural? Yeah. According to thousands, of course, they're not uh, getting to the modern medicine all the time. Yeah. They only suggest harmony. Mm -hmm. yeah. Harmony is the very important to keep the nature, to follow the nature, because nature was us. But everything harmony. If you're against nature, it's one, the harmony. That's why if people suffering to let them peace down and calm down. comment to Steph's question, I think um, uh, from Confucian view, the, uh, the Confucian ethics golden rule is what you do not wish for yourself, do not do others. And I think it is uh, consistent with the Western pr uh, principle of good, to do to others only what you wish others to do to you. So it's consistent with the Western principles. And uh, for the uh, original morality uh, in China, the then uh, humaneness, e registered means uh, the e propriety and the true wisdom uh, is uh, in the harmony with uh, the Western principle of autonomy, justice, do no harm and beneficence, beneficence and uh, as is a uh, harmony with uh, as Daryl said, uh, express a various form of love, self love, love of others, love lives and love goods. I think it's consistent. Our uh, Oriental cultures and Western cultures. Yeah, it's a universal balance. Okay. Last to Dana, and then I'm sorry, we have to. Uh, to answer this question, I just want to make a comment. How is the Buddhist? Uh, Buddhist. Uh, Buddhist. In my interview, some people they talk about Buddhist. But you know, in Taiwan, it's very interesting. Uh, I also have some data about those people's religions, but it's not so clear. Some say, oh, I'm Buddhist, and some say, okay, maybe God, I, I, don't, I don't know. So, a lot of people, they have philosophy, but they don't have religions. The Buddhist in Taiwan society, we will see is a philosophy more than a religion. Yet you, maybe some of you know that we have very big uh, association, Ji. Uh, they did a lot of things, but they are a uh, Buddhist company, uh, group, but they never talk about religion. They are talking about how to behave good, to help people, this kind of philosophy. And the Buddhists, uh, they talk about the um, detachment. That means uh, nothing is important mm -hmm. for you. Uh, you. Anyway, you will return to the original. That you. So, um, also they talk about karma. Uh, what, why I think like this, they have some reason, is uh, not only this life, they talk about the last life and the after life, and this kind of thing for the end of life. And um, for Confu uh, Confucianism and the Taoism, uh, you know, Lao Tzu is more senior than Con Confucian. Uh, when he wrote the Tao Te Ching, he was in the age of 70. So his philosophy, his thinking maybe uh, is for the elder people they may easily to understand. Because in the retirement statement and uh, a lot of life experience, you may understand the in-depth that. Uh, but in Confucian's uh, philosophy, they talk about the moral, moral life. They will encourage people to have make an effort for your life, that that is not important. You just make effort to what you can do for your life. So for the Chinese history, all the king, or you say emperor, they welcome Confucius philosophy. That's why it's the mainstream value in the society. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop so we'll be more raised their hands. But we must uh, move on. Thank you very much. I think, uh, in fact, in this message, in the end, the paper is asking us all. Uh,
to look at the Tao, Taoist, Confucianist, and Buddhist, and so on, inside every one of us. And, uh, it's an interesting, the influence of culture, and where the culture describes us, or shapes us, or does both. Um, the next uh, paper, the last one before afternoon tea, um, is from uh, Leonardo de Castro, and he's going to talk about the uh, Kadaran Pan Loop and organ donation, and he's going to tell you how to pronounce it properly, and excursion into the Filipino mind. Thank you. slides about controversies concerning organ transplantation in, in a number of countries. <coughs> All of these amount to controversy concerning the practice of organ transplantation. And uh, the controversies have, I feel, affected policies concerning organ transplantation and has resulted, the, the controversies have resulted in a kind of cynicism concerning organ transplantation to the point that the investigations have been conducted at very high levels This one concerns the kidney trade in the Philippines. And here is an example of a reference to investigations being conducted at high levels. Every slide on this presentation is worth 10,000 yen. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the result is something like this, which you have, they say in the Philippines, the RP, the Philippine Organ Transplant Program in Jeopardy. So, as regards publicity and fears, I think the negative publicity concerning organ transplantation has been generally deserved but the unfounded fears may slow down beneficial organ transplantation. In this kind of environment, I fear that kagandahang loob, or altruism, of donors cannot grow and bear fruit. So, I sense something like this dilemma in the Filipino mind. On the one hand, organ transplantation has enriched or saved many lives. And at the same time, kagandahang loob, or altruism, like a seed, has to be planted and nourished in order to grow and bear fruit. In this presentation, first of all, I tried to show that commodification and exploitation as arguments against payment for organ donation, uh, these arguments are faulty. That donation out of kagandahang loob or altruism ought to be commended. That kagandahang loob or altruism ought to be recognized as utang na loob 
or debt of gratitude or debt of goodwill, I prefer to put it like that. And that donors ought to be paid in reciprocity for their kagandahang loob. I want to say that we have to pay organ donors as long as we don't make them a slave to money and market forces. That organ donors should be paid without their having to ask for it. That to repay utang na loob or to repay the donor's altruism is to strengthen a bond between donor and recipient. When I speak of organ donation as kagandahang loob, I mean that these qualifications should be present. One, that there should be no coercion, that in a sense this act is self-initiated. No expectation of reward or personal benefit. Three, that it be conducted with the purest of intentions or with no hidden motivation. These three qualifications appear to me to have affected organ transplant policies, not only in the Philippines, but in other countries as well. Specifically those policies that say only relatives of recipients can serve as living donors. That donors cannot demand or exempt payment. First about commodity or commodification. Commodi a commodity may be defined as something fungible. And to say that something is fungible is to say that it is replaceable with money or other objects. Possessing a fungible object or kidney is the same as possessing money in that sense. Why do I say that commodification arguments fail? First, because I feel that they are not being realistic. Because the commodification of human organs is not something that is still waiting to happen. Human organs became, in a sense, a kind of commodity the first time that organ transplantation became a possibility because then it could be transferred from one person to another or from one body to another. The arguments do not recognize morally significant differences between different types of monetary exchange. What I want to say is that when money changes hands from one person to another, there is not necessarily a sale going on. To accept money, as in the case of a hero who is given a monetary reward, is not to have sold one's act of heroism. Thirdly, I feel that some of these arguments take the meaning of priceless or the word priceless too literally. What I want to say in response to that is that the price tag does not necessarily take away the pricelessness of an organ. Let me elaborate a bit on what that means. I want to say that organ donation has a cost. When there is an organ, an organ transplant that is performed, the doctors, the hospitals, the nurses, they all pay for their role in the transplant. But the organ donors cannot receive any payment. When organ donors make the most essential contribution to the transplant, I feel that that is a lopsided way of looking at the situation 
because a human organ may be priceless, but organ donation does have a cost. Now a word about exploitation. We are afraid that financial considerations will cloud the ability of donors to assess risks to themselves. We are afraid that if organ payments are given, that those who are rich can take advantage of the ignorance of the poor. So we are putting the poor, in a way, at the mercy of the rich. However, safety nets think can be established. Because even now, in the black market, exploitation is going on. Exploitation is being perpetrated on black market organ donors when there are transactions the terms of those transactions are not being monitored the health of the donor is not monitored and so as we can see from a number of examples according to Mr. G in the Philippines he got US $2,000 for his kidney a middleman according to the papers, received 750 US dollars for facilitating the sale. That's not even an accurate account from what I have learned. In many cases, the middlemen receive more money than the kidney donors themselves because they have the brains and the organ donors have only kidneys. And the brains sell more than the kidneys, even if they don't have to transplant the brains. Mr. G says the middleman took away all medical documents pertaining to his case. Edwin said he sold a kidney for 3,000 US dollars because he could not find a job. Five days after the operation, doctor gave him money and asked him to sign a four-page document that he did not even read. In the underground, there is no assurance of proper pre-transplant and post-transplant care for the donor because the donor has to hide. There is no adequate compensation for the risks, inconveniences, and burdens that are borne by the donor. And so the kidney vendors remain poor. And is this not a case of enforced, absurdly enforced, kagandahang loob? Kagandahang loob or altruism cannot be compelled. As I have said, while kagandahang loob is commendable, governments have no authority to make it compulsory. Besides, the idea of enforced altruism appears to be a contradiction in terms. Moreover, the enforcement of kagandahang loob in this manner results in the loss of lives or the failure to enhance what remains of a person's life. One of the things that is responsible, I think, is that we insist on a market paradigm as we look at organ transplantation. We talk about organ supply, a demand for organs, organ procurement, organ allocation, organ rationing. And so in this picture we have of donation and transplantation into the new millennium, we may have those ingredients, but where is the donor? You don't see the donor in the picture at all. There is somebody missing. I think 
it is important to substitute for it a kagandahang loob paradigm that focuses on a selfless consideration for the welfare of others. But we must clarify what that means. Organ donation as kagandahang loob creates an obligation to reciprocate. In other words, the kagandahang loob leads to an utang na loob on the part of the recipient, a debt of gratitude. And this is signaled by a feeling of hiya or embarrassment or shame on the part of the organ recipient. If I receive something from somebody else out of the goodness of his heart, then I feel a certain sense of embarrassment that I have received something out of the goodness of his heart without being able to reciprocate. And I must reciprocate that. If I do not reciprocate that kagandahang loob, then I am a person without shame, walang hiya. If you can only understand Filipino, you know how bad that sounds. Or walang utang na loob. No sense of indebtedness. I'm sorry, I cannot make you feel how bad that sounds. But it is not something which is like a contractual commitment. I have referred to it elsewhere as a quasi-obligation. It is open-ended in that there are no specific rules that tell a person how the debt of gratitude must be repaid. But it is open-ended in that it perpetrates a cycle of kagandahang loob and utang na loob. What do I mean by that cycle? If I owe somebody and I repay it, that person who gets the payment, the, the burden shifts to him so that again, there is a burden on him to repay what I have repaid. And the burden shifts back and forth within us or between us. Let me give you a simpler example, a, a, bit, a trivial one. If I had a neighbor and I decide one day to give him a plate of sweets that I have prepared, that plate must come back with another kind of something prepared by the neighbor. But when the plate comes back to me, then it creates another sense in me that tells me I must give it back to him with something else from me again. It is how that cycle is perpetrated. It never ends. So let me say again why we must pay organ donors. We must pay organ donors because we have to show our appreciation for kagandahang loob. The patient's response must address the most urgent need of the organ donor. And therefore, we have to compensate the poor in a manner that addresses their economic hardships. In this way, we can nourish an open-ended bond between donor and recipient. But again, a few clarifications. When we pay for the kagandahang loob, we do not necessarily pay just for the physical organ. And the compensation does not necessarily have to come in a monetary form. Maybe it should include pre-transplant and post-transplant care over an indefinite period for the donor. It might include psychological counseling economic support and advice, and sustained health care.
If we do that, then we will not promote an organ market where what you have are kidneys for transplant as if they were disembodied kidneys or kidneys removed from persons, but rather to cultivate a community with kagandahang loob where our focus is not on the kidneys but on people like these and these and these. Thank you very much. some other form of uh, reward. Like, like we give rewards for heroism, we give rewards for people who make other kinds of contributions to society, and we let them know what the rewards are going to be in advance. The, the question is to people who still feel pressurized, even though they don't want to give an organ, they feel compelled to do it, so they don't do it out of the honorable uh, goodness of their heart, but they feel pressurized to do it, and therefore are prepared to go, well, just for money. And how can you prevent it with this practice? It's, it might not be totally prevented in the same way that rewards uh, that are given to, say, war heroes might uh, serve as incentives for, for uh, what's it called, <laughs> those who they go to battle for mercenaries. The mercenaries. Yeah. There's, there's no absolute guarantee, but at least it gives us a different option to present people. Okay, Irina next. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 Irina first. <laughs> Thank you, Leia, for a most interesting talk and for opening up this serious question. Um, there's been similar discussions in relation to reproductive products, sperm and eggs and embryos. Do you, do you feel that perhaps altruism in that area also warranted some sort of payment? Or should that remain free, especially with increasing incidence of human infertility rates? If I were to compare uh, uh, eggs, human, human uh, eggs or, or sperm to uh, kidneys, uh, the answer would sound uh, so easy. But, but if I am willing to uh, make it a policy that people can receive payment for for uh, kidneys, then I should have no objection to people being given money for. Uh, for their donations of uh, ova or sperm. There, there might be some other argument though concerning uh, uh, the nature of uh, eggs and what they... Exactly. I mean, it creates another generation. Uh, yeah, also, I, uh, super ovulation. Yeah, I haven't thought much about yes. that angle. Yeah. And I would rather, for the moment, uh, Skip it to yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so you're 
I did a field research in the in the <laughs> India and Philippines and Bangladesh almost five or six years, so from 1992, and uh, um, I wrote the information. Do you know how much is a bone marrow for bone marrow transplant? So <coughs> the, co the price itself only several cc. It's free, free. Bone marrow itself is free, but for expenses, five million yen from United States to Japan, and we are importing. For example, uh, you are, you talked about uh, kidney for transplant. For Japanese importing organs for medical research, so a full kidney, a full liver uh, with AIDS patient or whole brain with uh, brain cancer, so they have prices. So it is completely legal, lawful. And uh, even head, 20 heads was imported from the United States three or four years ago. Or brain transplant? <laughs> For, not, 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 not still. <laughs> it's for... But it was after that. <laughs> not from the middle. You see, human tissue for medical research, uh, even dead or... Uh, for, suppose, uh, you know, more case. You know, more, more, more case. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, all of human bodies becoming commodity. Uh, commercialized goods. Yeah. So, so there is a big cheating system for organ donation system. So, you see, my wish is poor, so newspaper man never pay the resource of news. So, if medical doctor or hospital pay money for donor, so if Organ itself has prices, it will be big problem. So it's a not moral reason. So from political uh, policy reason, I think. Mm. So for example, once uh, tissues cells for research for production of um, medical supplies. So, for testing, uh, test, test for, we use so microsome, uh, my, uh, uh, liver microsome with, uh, is used for test for drugs. So, uh, it's a uh, good uh, commodity. So human body itself is becoming commodities. And my, sorry, my English, but I want to say one more. So this uh, organ donation system is from American or European countries. It's based on philanthropism, philanthropism, or benevolence. Yeah, but uh, we have uh, in Asian country have no this kind of thinking. No philanthropism. So in India, so there are a lot of poor people, and in Philippines, so it so many patients and technology. So and in China, so many death penalty uh, uh, execution. So it is uh, combined, uh, combined. Mm. So. We are, so for example, Japanese, we, in Japan, four years or five years ago, we made a, an organ transplantation law, but only 20 transplant, so uh, from brain dead cadavers. But, so family related donors, so many. This means we have almost no philanthropism, so in India, say, in Philippines, Bangladesh. The Asian country almost the same. So the real reason so why 
we have no oral trans almost no transplant. So is uh, this kind of system different? I'll reserve my comments to that. Day. Okay, well, actually, for practical purposes, we've got three people in down this row, so we'll go in order John Ru, Ali, and Frank. My question is Please very simple. Yeah. Uh, I understand why you uh, have written this kind of rather uh, thought provoking and provocative uh, you know, piece of writing, piece of uh, paper. And I wonder if. Your proposal, your proposal, your ideas uh, could be accepted by the uh, Filipino government in order to, uh, as you propose, uh, I mean, in order to the prevent the exploitation in the black market currently, currently uh, in practice. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, actually, I completely agree with you that any parties receive their benefits except donors. But uh, I'm not agree to establish any direct uh, monetary relationship between donors and recipients or donors and uh, recipients' family. We have an experience in my country that there is a, an NGO who gives money to the donors or donors' family. And uh, any rela direct relationship is prohibited. And I think it leads us to have a black market more than, that, than the current black market which uh, exists in some countries. And we should emphasize that uh, any direct relationship, monetary relationship, must be prohibited between donors and recipients. Thank you. Uh, Leo, you spoke mostly about uh, kidneys. Uh, would you uh, allow for uh, payment for organs that can only be taken after death, like hearts and, uh, and so on? Uh, what I mean is either uh, compensating somebody, maybe through Kadang Hang Lo, uh, compensating somebody for signing an organ donation card, or compensating the family for an organ which is taken uh, after the death of the uh, donor. Yeah, do I think do I think that it is a proposal that can be accepted by the Philippine uh, government? Uh, not immediately, perhaps. I, I'm on the National uh, Organ uh, Development Advisory Board and uh, and partly responsible for um, formulating policies as regards this uh, these things, and uh, uh, although I've spoken in private to some of the other members of the board and to the members of the National the Transplant Ethics uh, Committee, I have not mentioned uh, this thing. Although. There have been many doctors who have been advocating that uh, payment to organ donors uh, be allowed. I don't think that in the near future this can be acceptable, especially with a lot of politicians ready to uh, uh, project themselves as heroes the moment anything controversial comes up. The moment, in other words, the moment somebody makes a controversial proposal like this, then one of the politicians is likely to to uh, project himself as a hero, protecting uh, people, protecting the public from this kind of uh, commodification and commercialism, and uh, this will not progress in advance. Unless some of those politicians uh, need a transplant immediately <laughs> and perhaps we should try to make sure that they do need that right away but maybe more of them need brain transplants than kidney transplants <laughs> what about the direct relationship between uh, donor and uh, 
second year, Ali, I take you to uh, mean a direct uh, transaction between the donor and recipient? Yeah. Even as a gift. Even as a uh, gift. gift. But I'm, I'm torn between uh, the two positions as regards those things. One, uh, <coughs> at the moment we do have a lot of underground uh, the brokers. Uh, I, I also sit on the transplant ethics committee of one of the hospitals that does uh, kidney, uh, kidney and other organ transplants. And uh, our job in that committee has been to interview uh, donors, prospective donors, to see whether, uh, because, because monetary payments are not allowed right now, so one of the things that we try to determine is whether they are really doing this without any monetary uh, consideration. And uh, we have not come across anybody who says he is doing it for monetary consideration. But uh, what we have noticed is that there are many volunteers who come from the uh, community where Tsuyoshi wants to do his research, where there are a lot of uh, volunteer donors. So we wonder whether this small community is really so uh, so so uh, uh, pregnant with altruism <laughs> that every other house has somebody who wants to uh, donate a kidney. So uh, there must be somebody who is acting as a broker. Uh, what, what I suggest in our case is that this place of brokers be taken over by professional transplant coordinators in the country right now, as in many other countries uh, where transplantation is done uh, legally. We have uh, trained transplant coordinators who, uh, who interview and counsel transplant donors and recipients but they come in quite late in the picture they come in when the donor is there already and has made arrangements with the, the recipient I feel that and I have suggested that to uh, people in our uh, advisory board that these professionals should be out there and try aggressively to take the place of the brokers so that the brokers will be professional people who are really after the welfare of the recipients and the donors and not out there to make money for themselves. In a way, they will also be uh, putting the donors and the recipients close to one another, but in a sort of guided way. May I suggest that if you establish a third party, independent third party, as an NGO or non-profit organization, that they would be responsible to give gift or reward to the donor after finishing the procedure. Quite independent from coordinators or any parties who are involved in organ transplantation, even ethics committee. Mm -hmm. And then maybe it, it helps you to solve the problem as we did in my country. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, perhaps I should talk to you some more about those ways. Yes. What about the <coughs> donating a heart after death? Uh, initially, I, I would say yes, I would allow that. Uh, but I'm quite concerned about uh, people trying to rush the death so that the heart can be made available. <laughs> and and uh, right now I don't know what to say. I have not talked to a lot of people about heart transplants and, and I would have to see uh, more technical details before, before I can answer the question uh, properly, I think. <laughs> Okay, uh, um, so make it very brief, so you're please. Thank you. So, there was one doctor in 
a Madras Chennai. His name is Casey Reddy. He made a good system. So uh, he collected uh, donors and patients both. So no middleman. Uh, it's fit is for you. Okay. His system. Now, but he stopped because it, India had made a lower provision. So Philippines is a very particular special situation you have. So there's only one country which has no prohibition about organ trade. You have an organ donation law, but that law did not <coughs> prohibit. Only one country. It, it's Philippines. So I visited Philippine Ministry of Health last month. So they say that doctor says they are making living donors system, uh, no, uh, including Kadaba. So, but it's almost no uh, no system in the world in the world only Philippines. So it include is it does it include giving money uh, or say? But doctor says so we we cannot understand so. Doctors only have an operation. So patient or donors pay money underground. But government itself is uh, they are making because it is lawful. It is not not illegal. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the giving of money is not is not uh, prohibited by law but it is prohibited by an administrative order issued by the, the Secretary of Health. No punishment. It does not provide for a specific punishment. We're... we're uh, a, a kind of guideline, like Japanese style. Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> it says, it says uh, uh, payment is, is not allowed. Uh, in this administrative order, but it does not say what will be done to people who get involved in giving payment. Okay, we have a, a Lana and Rob and then a, a... Just a few words. I know that this is going to happen very well because we have been, uh, uh, many patients uh, come to uh, Philippines and uh, even in India to get uh, through a network, uh, a very huge network of uh, the support and traders. Uh, but the problem is when we, I, I know and others know also that there is the doctors are involved in that. So the problem is when the doctors became the middle, uh, this person in the middle, and uh, they are organized this network. And they, they said, because we heard the patient said, okay, we don't find for me organ and uh, I will see him on my own and uh, so on. And then the patient disappear and go there to other doctors when they come back. Uh, so uh, if we has the, um, the ethical uh, uh, commitment of the doctors uh, everywhere, uh, I think it's, it's very important to stop uh, the, this kind of uh, 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 this organ uh, uh, trade uh, and uh, yeah, the do doctors must refuse. We have to have this uh, guarantee that the doctors are really ethically co commit, uh, involved in such things and to refuse and beside what the society and the community will organize for the administration, the policy, the national policy. But the problem is also in the doctor's attitude. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rob, please. Uh... I would just have one uh, short uh, comment and one short question. Uh, first, the practical question. Who are mostly the uh, buyers of the tournaments? And the second one, uh, would uh, a legal uh, network uh, like the Euro Transplant uh, maybe be an alternative uh, to abolish the illegal trade of the organs? Would the what? Uh, like a legal uh, um, network and uh, uh, transplant. Uh, it's like an organization between membering states. It's called the Euro Transplant. It's uh, a legal one and uh, of course free of charge. I mean, on altruistic uh, fundaments and uh, 
would that kind of organization or network uh, be possible they would uh, abolish the illegal one? As regards Lana's uh, points, you know, there is a joke going around in uh, the Philippines among transplant doctors that uh, in the parking lot of one of the hospitals where they do a lot of organ transplants, you can see parked there many camels. The camels are used in the um, rich Middle Eastern countries. And uh, the idea is that the uh, rich Middle Easterners go there for their kidney transplants and that's why they can find a lot of camels in the parking lot. Uh, <coughs> the thing about the camels is a joke, but the thing about the rich Middle Easterners going there for transplants is not. A transplant tourism, uh, as some people call it, is it, something that is uh, practiced and uh, of course, there's an element of uh, injustice in that because if there is some kind of injustice in the poor giving up their kidneys in order that the rich can survive, which partly answers the question about who gets the kidneys, then uh, there is more of an injustice in the poor people's uh, kidneys from one country being given to rich people from another country still. Uh, but it is also important to recognize really the responsibility of doctors here. Many doctors say as long as the patient is there to receive the, the organ and the donor is there, I don't bother to interview the donor uh, where he comes from, uh, has he received any money, and so on. That is not my job. He says, I am there in the uh, operating room. My job is to move a kidney from one body to another, and that's as far as uh, the responsibility that I can see. Uh, the World Medical Association's uh, declaration on organ transplantation says, the transplant surgeon must assume responsibility for the source of the donor organ. But I don't think doctors even know that at all. Uh, so basically, if the doctors do assume that responsibility, then a lot can be done. Well, who are the buyers? The buyers are the professionals. A, a professional, a, a uh, statistical study has been done, and uh, very clearly, the donor organs come from very poor people, and the recipients are the rich and the professional ones. Although uh, there is an attempt in the main, the main uh, transplant hospital to uh, balance things out by providing that if there is an uncommitted organ available, every second one will be f for a uh, charity patient so that there will always be a kind of sharing scheme. If, if the rich people can, can uh, buy or can provide money for uh, their services. I mean, this is not for the organ itself, but for the um, for the other services. The, the thing is, it is not only the organ that costs uh, money, also the other services and the drugs involved. Many patients are too poor to afford the uh, drugs uh, that have to be used. So if they cannot afford to buy the drugs, how can they afford to have a, a transplant? So. There are attempts at uh, evening things out between the rich and the poor, but uh, that is too little to solve the huge inequality.
thank you very much, Leo. Thank you. Thank you. Intra International Congress on Ethical Issues in Brain Deaths and Organ Transplantation on 1st, 2nd, 3rd of November of this year will be held in Tsukuba, this city. Uh, main theme is uh, Children and Organ Transplantation. Please, please come and uh, welcome to this uh, Congress. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much. November 1st to 3rd. 1st, 2nd, 3rd, is that right? Uh, first announcement will be appear tomorrow in this room. <laughs> 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 this was a, just a preview. Um, so, uh, thank you for the interesting discussion. You took off uh, 15 minutes of your tea break, but um, I thought it's better for you to enjoy the discussion. I, before we stop, I just want to um, uh, give a chance for those who just came to the room to introduce themselves since lunch. Uh, we'll start from around here, and we'll go around. Uh, please, attention, please. Introduce myself. Yes. Uh, my name is Takashi Chia, and I'm from uh, Osaka, uh, North City. And about, uh, it takes about uh, seven hours to come from my home to here. So, uh, pray for me to uh, be right here. But I am very uh, happy to be here, and uh, very happy to... Uh, meet you again. Thank you very much. Uh, and my, my name is Masahiro Morioka, and I'm from Osaka too. And I am an, an one of the associate editors of the journal, UBIOS Journal. And I'm going to present my, uh, my paper on Monday. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who else I'm Yuka Mariana. I'm from Skuba, actually. I work with GlaxoSmithKline Skuba Research Lab. It uh, seems to be I'm the only one from the industry, so I'm going to be very quiet. I'm Michael Kunenjo Jang. I'm from Cameroon. I took two days to this year. I'm working with a non governmental organization. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Um, is there anyone at uh, college, please? Uh, my name is uh, Karachi I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm uh, at Tsukuba University in the Department of Life and Environmental Sciences. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to meet you. Thank you very much. Did I miss anybody? <laughs> I don't think so. Let's see. Um, Masuki, could you introduce yourself? Hello. Uh, my name is Masaiki Takahashi. Uh, I am an uh, undergraduate student of Tsukuba University. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to present my research. So come to here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, now we're going to have a tea break for I think 15 minutes. Uh, would like? Would you prefer 20 minutes? Yeah. Maybe 20 minutes, and then um, I'll just inform you, so it's at 6 o'clock tonight we'll have a reception, everyone's welcome. The reception will be in a, uh, about um, 50 meters from here, in a different uh, floor, fifth floor. And um, so we can start the reception immediately after the session closes at 6 o'clock. So when it comes to 6 o'clock, you can those people asking lots of questions may are not be so popular. <laughs> Thank you very much for a stimulating afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Paneet Ratanaki uh, unfortunately could not come from Thailand. Um, so the first speaker is, uh, 
falling from this, most of national, regional, and international instruments espouse such an approach as well. However, a global approach to human dignity in bioethics and bio-law has to take into consideration the broader health issues and develop on the lines of universal applicability. The Universal Declaration of the Human Genome and Human Rights 1997, uh, which was drafted by the UNESCO, has declared the human genome to be the heritage of humanity. One of the implications of such a common heritage would be that the interests of stakeholders, though I don't like the word stakeholders, but I'll have to use that because that's the word used in places that matter, from all over the world has to be considered or has to be included. Basically, humanity is the stakeholder in the human genome. Now, the concept of human dignity hinges very much on the scope of the discussions. If, for example, if it is at the European level, then the right of the person with regard to the application of biotechnology would gain paramount importance. However, in the context of Africa, a discussion of human dignity will focus on very different considerations. But since the human genome is the heritage of humanity, and interventions in the human genome are a part and parcel of public health, it is but appropriate to discuss and define the scope of human dignity in the, concept, uh, in the context of global health. I've considered the uh, one sort of concrete uh, legal document in this area, which is the European Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine. And 1997, and that concentrates completely and does an excellent job of elucidating individual rights, just as the full title of the convention indicates. It is protection of human rights and dignity of the human being with regard to application of biology and medicine. Europe, of course, leads the rest of the world in biotics debates and bio law, yet it does not consider numerous pressing problems like patenting and ownership, problems of new genetics, equity in health, the genetic divide, and eugenics. Perhaps they don't need to. But at the international level, at the level of humanity, we need to discuss more issues under the new, new uh, let's say, human biotechnology to make, to make more spe uh, specific. Of course, patenting issues have received some attention uh, at patent offices, but they have to decide applications without much guidance from outside debates which are inclusive. And the trips uh, might be considered the sort of uh, final say at the international level for patents, but that was not really defined to address ethical dilemmas in patenting of biomaterials. The other issues which have been neglected, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. Um, okay, let's consider, for example, um, the, the case of uh, debate around designer babies. The debate here is whether designer babies violate the rights of future generations. And that is an issue that, is, that has to be addressed and is being addressed. But the other issue of eugenics that is involved in selection of traits is not being addressed with as much importance as it warrants. So the question, of, the question is whether we can allow the baby to be born according to the wishes of the parents, etc. But the bigger question is worded in terms of eugenics of, about whether even though it's not the government, or even though it's not a high authority or state imposing a particular selection there, but whether we, you know, people as, as a community, as a population, can still do the selection, that is not being addressed within this question. The next question is about, uh, by giving this option itself, how much of a genetic divide do we create? While a part of the world is still talking about uh, whether we could get vaccinations or you know, problems which relate to preventable diseases, another part of the world is absolutely ob oblivious to this, and the discussions are at a completely different level. So can we, can we actually, well, I would use the word allow, science and technology to progress in such a way that it, creates a gen the, the, it increases in the genetic divide or it increases the divide by bringing this other divide, which is a genetic divide. Now, this is not a part of mainstream bioethical discussions, but I think which it should be. Right, so having said the same for discussion of my main theme today, I proceed to elucidate what my global view of human dignity is. 
One of the fundamental concepts at the central bioethics debates is the notion of human dignity. And I agree, it is very difficult to come to terms with such a concept as human dignity. And especially after uh, we had the discussion in the morning, and I think someone came up with the thing that human dignity is false, or human dignity is, <laughs> has to be changed and uh, modified. So uh, it's, it, it got me thinking more, but I think I'll stick to my text here. Um, <coughs> I would look at human dignity as something that is of inherent worth. It's the, it is all about humaneness, and it is about being endowed with something which comes along with us once we come to existence. So, the right to maintain the status quo as a human being I think will be in keeping with human dignity. Put to survive on, freedom from preventable disease, clothing, shelter, would be the bare essentials to ensure the existence as a human being and to live in dignity. However, as these amenities are taken care of, the protection of dignity climbs into a different level where the considerations are different. And the underlying implication is that these basic necessities have been taken care of. But also it might be the case that the majority of the people's basic necessities have been fulfilled and, and the debate moves on. But here again, we, there is already a violation of human dignity because it has not been inclusive. We have not thought about the every, every human being. And now, sort of extrapolating this into the international scene, there, have, there are communities of population that we actually exclude if we are going to look at human dignity, dignity at a sort of uh, a higher definition. In the sense, if you say informed consent, satisfies the requirement of human dignity, how much that, that, does that really apply to different populations across the world? So uh, if, if we're trying to elucidate a global view of human dignity, what, what all do we have to take into consideration? Or what is the basic or the fundamental definition that we have to use and then go off from there? That's what I'm trying to uh, open up the discussion for as well later on. Of course, within the... Uh, context of human dignity as we understand now, or as a sort of working definition, there are problems itself. And to illustrate that, I take the example of the famous, um, the, the French dwarf throwing case. And I'm not sure how, how many people have heard about this practice of dwarf throwing. Uh, is everybody familiar? Right, Australians, yes. I've not heard of it. I've not heard of it. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Okay, I think I'll go ahead and... Uh, Morgan, maybe you want to explain about it? Well, it's... Uh, basically, it is what it says, dwarf throwing, but it's um, for the amusement of taller people. Uh, it's a sport or a, a fun thing to do. You put a helmet on a dwarf and throw them. But see, can you stand up more? That? Sorry? Can you stand up and show us how tall you are? <laughs> <laughs> For the amusement of a tall person. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it has its origins in Australia and the US, and then it sort of came over to Europe. Well, the case actually uh, was in France. It was in, uh, uh, I don't know whether you call it uh, small provinces or something, two uh, small towns in France where uh, this practice was going on in the pubs where they used to toss the vertically challenged people. And it used to be, most of them used to be drunk and they used to have chants and it, it, was a, it was a fantastic pastime and most of the people in the towns actually used to go for that. But of course there are some who didn't and they brought the case up before the local courts. And the local court decided that it is against dignity and therefore they cannot be done and therefore there was a ban and all the dwarves, uh, the vertically challenged people went out of um, they had to go out of the jobs because they were, they were left jobless. And so they took up the case to the uh, highest court. Um, and the highest court also pronounced similarly, saying this is against human dignity. But uh, one of the dwarfs, uh, the vertically challenged person, he challenged uh, the decision based on the fact that it is against his human dignity because he has lost his means of employment. So basically, he doesn't have any money. So uh, if he was tossed around, he would only get bruised, and, but he'd still be able to live. But 
now he has to roam the streets and he says uh, he might even die of hunger. So that was his petition when he went up to the, uh, uh, the I think, UN Commission of Human Rights. And the UN Commission of Human Rights also, uh, this was a decision that was given out in October last. And uh, they again, they said, in keeping with human dignity, this practice cannot go on. But my objection with all the decisions is, whose human dignity are they really trying to protect? Is it better for him to get thrown around, tossed around, get a few bruises? Or would he just, would he and his family just starve? If he got tossed around, then it's the people who are feeling around, or, well, not the people who are tossing around, but maybe the other people in the society actually feel uncomfortable, and maybe the courts actually assess the feeling or address the discomfort of these people. But once he goes out of the picture, you know, once he's unemployed and once his family is not, uh, doesn't have anything to live on, then the people actually don't get to see it. So basically, they just go out of our sight and horizon, and therefore people just feel comfortable. So basically, whose dignity are we trying to address? And after having read the decisions, I, I, I saw that what they didn't really address is the dwarf's uh, woe itself, you know, his, his dignity. So if he loses means of employment, so how are you going to address that? How are you compensating him uh, for that? Of course, it's one thing to actually uh, go into his claims of whether he's going to lose, I mean, whether he doesn't have anything else to do. But again, if you approach it from the right angle, like, you know, I know what's best for me, then you have to take the dwarf's, uh, the vertically challenged person's uh, uh, angle for what it is. And consider that he's actually lost his dignity because uh, he can't earn his means of livelihood anymore. So, so what I mean to say is there are problems even within our sort of... Uh, already, uh, in a way, a consensus agreement of human dignity at this level. Uh, the other idea that I want to put forward is, even though there seem to be many ideas of uh, human dignity, different types of ideas, if it is taken in conjunction with some other principles that are floating around, uh, for example, the principle of human solidarity, then we might be able to come to a working definition of human dignity, which can actually be applied in, let's say, the Universal Declaration of the uh, Human Genome and Human Rights, which is only a declaration now, but which is which people are trying to maybe push to become a convention. And if that has to be the case, then we have to clarify these terms in, uh, for, for, for the purposes of uh, law, in the, in the sense that we have to be able to enforce something. Like, for example, if we have to... Uh, if you have to guarantee someone their, their dignity, how are you going to actually, what are the rights that you derive from them? So, from a global idea of human dignity, what are the rights that you can uh, derive? This would be the next step. So, I, I'm still trying to grasp what would be the contents of this global idea of human dignity. But I know it has to be all-inclusive, and I know it can't be based on the uh, present debates that we have uh, in, in bioethics. And of course, the uh, context of human dignity and the, the definition of the context would be new, the new human genomics and biotechnology. And it is within that context that I would like to develop this global idea of human dignity. <laughs> so I think I have to finish, but I'm looking forward to uh, all of your views. And for me, it's a learning experience, as I said before. And I hope people come up with questions. Learn later that you never ask the chair to do it more time. <laughs> um, if you want to continue, um, Morgan, please. Um, you are, I probably don't need the mic. Um, you asked whose dignity is is um, the prohibition of dwarf tossing designed to protect. It's not the dwarf being thrown. I think it's the group of dwarfs watching it on the TV who are not being thrown that need their dignity protected. And uh, that leads back to your original point, which I um, highly commend you for making, which is that um, the bioethics debate at the current time is very individual-centric. And um, I think it's important that groups uh, be the unit of um, bioethical debate. For example, um, many of the traditional ethical um, 
principles are about love thy neighbour or how an individual should interact with another individual and yet at the group level um, we allow warfare and it's a matter of prioritisation as you said the basic necessities of preventable disease is a, perhaps a higher priority than eugenic or cloning debates and yeah, we'll, Yeah. Well, I think I have a comment about the first um, idea that you said, protecting the dignity of um, the other dwarfs. I think, yeah, that's one thing we have to keep in mind. But um, the other dimension would be that, I mean, we're actually being complacent by trying to say that they, the, the, the anger the courts took that the dignity of, the human dignity has to be protected. Because we have not addressed in any way the real cause of this person who claimed that his human dignity was uh, being violated. So I would have, in a way, agreed with the decision of the courts if they had gone into more detail uh, to also the feelings of the petitioner, which they actually totally brushed aside and went on into a rhetorical debate about human dignity. It just left concepts just hanging. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought your talk was very interesting, and but I have some questions. Uh, one point I didn't understand. I thought you said the discussion about uh, a possible future inequality between uh, genetic identities of people will be a big problem and it's not being discussed at the moment, not enough anyway. I presume you're aware of the work of Lee Silva. Um, he did make a lot of uh, commotion uh, around the thesis that in 350 years time, 95% uh, of the people would be inferior genetically to a uh, five top level. Uh, of course, we'll have to see whether it work out like that because we need some study about society, whether it actually works like that. I was wondering, um, could you give us a definition of eugenics, how you regard it um, as well, opposed to uh, enhancement of children and designer babies? Because I find it very difficult to define eugenics uh, at the level of groups or, well, for instance, in reference to Eugenic policies in China? Well, actually, uh, I think a lot of work is being done, and you know, about especially uh, the eugenic trends that uh, the new technologies are fostering. Uh, Jeremy Rifkin, for example, is very open about it in his book. But um, sort of my, my angle is I mean, there's so much of it out in society, but how much of it is actually being fed into the legal processes? Because Ultimately, you will have to actually punish the people who are doing it, because now we've seen that uh, you know we have the clones, uh, clone the new clones, about three or four of them now, and we don't know how true it is. But still, ultimately, it's the law that sort of uh, says, look, you can do this, you can't do this, and there is fear there anyway. I mean, agreed or not, uh, we have to do it at that le legal level, and and at the level of law, I mean, the legal debates, still all of these questions have not been addressed. <coughs> Especially in Europe, where there is a lot of uh, translation of these bioethical debates into uh, legal policies and the uh, convention that we've already seen, that in no way addresses any of these issues. But of course, it's only uh, catering to the EU, where maybe this is not a uh, very right issue, but I'm not really sure, but I think still it matters to uh, every region. But um, just on that angle, I was talking about you know the uh, debates being. Uh, addressing eugenics. And the second part of your question about definition of eugenics, uh, uh, well, I must tell you that I don't know very much about it. I've been reading about it in different sense, but I've not looked at uh, looked at sort of defining it, because for me it's more of, you know, interactive. Because uh, being a lawyer, I would rather like to get the opinions of people and then take the best view from that. And to define eugenics would rather require someone specialist in that rather than someone like me. But I'm sure it's important to sort of get a legal definition after a consensus in the field. 
many people have the suspicion that eugenics is already here. Uh, like oh, I think it is. Cloning a, yeah. a baby because later on we have more money, and some people would call that individual eugenics, and other people would strictly regard government interference into people's choices, but as they want to have children, uh, eugenics. So I think that would be a, a major thing. To well, I think that's a sort of false, whether it's governmental or whether it's society driven, I think eugenics is still eugenics. I mean, selection of traits is what I think would it's be the main special. component. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid I'm, I'm sorry. We're going to have to have the last question. Steve. Thank you. Um, I'm a little confused about the, um, the, the, the meaning of the, the term human dignity um, in the context in which you're using it, because when I, when I think of human dignity, it's hard to separate it from the, the, the concept of human rights, which puts us, moves us more toward an individual bioethics. Um, so how, 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 how does human dignity, or developing a notion of a, of a global human dignity, move us away from individual bioethics to a more uh, humanity or right. group oriented bioethics? Right, I think uh, uh, I would explain with an example. Like, um, let's say there is um, there's a particular project planned, yeah, relating to biotechnology, maybe the haplotype mapping project, for example. I mean, just getting it off the head. Uh, of course, what's being discussed within that there are sort of ethical aspects within the project itself, like how do you collect the samples and how do you get informed consent and how do you uh, later on maintain anonymity uh, with the data, etc. So all this would, of course, satisfy or would be based on human dignity, in a way, because uh, right to privacy comes from, it's a human right and comes obviously from the base of human dignity. But if you're going to apply now the, human, the concept of human dignity to, let's say, this project as a whole, so, the, so can we or can we give a green signal to this project? Will it be uh, against human dignity for this project to go on, or will it be, uh, you know, for so it is that kind of question? It's sort of progress of science and technology. You know, maybe if you want to sort of bring it further into uh, individual rights approach, then is the right to scientific research? How is that, you know, based on human dignity? Can it be overridden? Such sort of a debate. But thank you very much, Helen. Thank you.